Halston was the most influential designer of the 20th century, the man who single-handedly reshaped American fashion, whose name was known by all, and whose designs were worn by seemingly everyone, from the first lady, A-listers, the working woman, and to the lower classes. But was this inclusivity ultimately self-sabotage, or was it his excessive partying and drug abuse that led to both the death of him and his brand? Well, let's take a look at the fascinating, true story of the man behind the sexiest, simplest, and streamlined looks of the 70s and 80s. Roy Holston Froick, known worldwide as simply Holston, was born in 1932. He had humble beginnings, growing up in Des Moines, Iowa, as the son of a Norwegian-American accountant and a stay-at-home mother. His nickname originated to distinguish young Roy Holston from his Uncle Roy, and it never left. As a child, he developed a love for sewing from his grandmother. He then began to make hats and alter clothes for both his mother and sister. Holston briefly studied at Indiana University and later studied art on the night courses at the Institute of Chicago. He'd spend his days working as a fashion merchandiser, dressing window displays at a department store, Carson Piri Scott. Holston's childhood hobbies proved noteworthy as he started his career as a successful milliner, a hat maker. Age 21, he met Andre Basil, a hairdresser with a salon at the Ambassador Hotel in Chicago. And Basil loved Holston and his work. So in 1953, he set up a display of Holston hats in his salon. His first big break was a feature in the Chicago Daily News, all about him and his hats. A few years later, when Basil opened his Boulevard Salon on North Michigan Avenue in 1957, he offered Holston half of the space for his display. Holston took it and worked from here until later that year when he was offered a job in New York. He accepted and moved to the big city to work as a milliner for Lily Dash. He stayed there for a year where he became co-designer and was able to network with fashion editors and publishers. He then moved to be head milliner at Bergdorf Goodman's where he accumulated a celebrity clientele. In 1961, his career was catapulted as first lady Jackie Kennedy wore a custom designed pillbox hat to her husband's presidential inauguration. Holston's friends and clients soon became some of the most alluring and well-known women in the world, including Risa Hayworth, Liza Minnelli, Marlene Dietrich, and Diana Vreeland. A few years on, in 1966, as hats fell out of fashion, Holston moved on to designing women's wear, starting with couture and ready to wear. His first collection debuted with a runway show at Bergdorf Goodman. In 1969, with the financial backing of a Texan millionaire, Estelle Marsh, Holston was able to create his own company, Holston Limited. Hats, scarves, shoes, jewelry, furs, and leather were amongst his portfolio. His ready-to-wear was simple and comfortable, yet glamorous and sophisticated. He told Vogue how he hated wrap dresses, zippers, buttons, and ties that didn't work. Instead, he opted for free-flowing fabrics that naturally melted onto the women's body as she wore it. He was also a huge advocate for trousers. He saw the convenience and freedom that they provided for women and preempted their popularity. Pants will be with us for many years to come, probably forever if you can make that statement in fashion, he said. In 1968, he opened his first boutique on Madison Avenue, and not long after, he was securing deals to produce various other collections. In 1970, he established Holston International to offer knitwear and accessories at a more accessible price point, and in 1972, an outwear collection. He also renamed his ready-to-wear lines to Holston Originals. However, with such rapid growth, Holston could not keep up with the legal and financial obligations of business. So in 1973, he sold his company to Norton Simon Inc. for $12 million, where it was renamed Holston Enterprises. This new large corporate structure kept Holston as an executive, whilst giving him the space to focus on creating. But was selling his name the right next step for him? Or was this the decision that led his brand to its demise? Let's find out. 1973 was also a big year for American fashion altogether. November 28th, a day for the history books. A day with one singular event solidifying the US's position as the leader of the fashion industry at that time. Ella actually put a poll on this in the Look Circle the other day Day, which by the way is where we have all our daily conversations with you guys in our community about all things luxury fashion and anyway we asked which country do you think is the leader of the fashion industry today and here are the results if you want to make sure that you're in our conversation next time subscribe to see our posts anyway the big day the most significant fashion show of all time 
still being referenced 50 years later, the Battle of Versailles. Held in the infamous Palace of Versailles, originally home to the French ruler, the grand building is now a museum and host to many events. This battle was between five French designers and five American. The Americans, Holston, Bill Blass, Oscar de la Renta, Anne Klein, and Stephen Burroughs, against the French Yves Saint Laurent, Hubert Givenchy, Pierre Cardin, Emmanuel Ngaro, and Marc Bohan. It was a showdown. France versus America in their culture, taste, skill, and work. The foundational reason for the event was to fundraise for the restoration of the Palace of Versailles, but its significance in the acknowledgement of the leader of fashion at that time held much more importance. Halston showcased America's finest sportswear on his famous model friends. Not just that, but his display was a huge step forward in terms of diversity and inclusivity in the modeling world, as 10 black models were enlisted to sport his looks. The US brought simple, fresh designs, a completely new concept to the Europeans and the French who created pieces of grandeur and opulence. The audience chose their winner with a roaring applause. The headlines that followed read, Americans came, they sewed, they conquered. Thanks to Holston and his work, American fashion was now visible and desired on the global stage, a monumental moment in history. Yet thanks to Holston, it almost didn't happen. He had a disagreement with the original event choreographer, Kay Thompson, which led to Holston's demands for its cancellation. Instead, Thompson stepped down and the show went ahead under the new leadership of Eleanor Lambert, the lady in charge of putting America on the international map. For the rest of the decade, Holston designed the dresses that define the 70s. His style? Sexy staples for the disco era. His lifestyle inspired his work and vice versa. Holston and his friends were fixtures on the 70s and 80s disco party scene across New York, most famously at Studio 54. He designed and lived lavishly, often hosting major parties at his Upper East Side townhouse with his celebrity contacts Liza Minnelli, Andy Warhol, Truman Capote and Elsa Peretti. This infamous home was actually purchased by Tom Ford in 2019 for $18 million, as Ford was hugely inspired by Holston and his designs during his early career. The Holt address was one of the most popular pieces becoming the go-to look for icons such as Bianca Jagger and Marlene Dietrich. He created many other iconic silhouettes, including the Swinger in 1977, made to be easy to walk and run in, the graphic printed slip dress, wrap dresses and the high rise dress said to elongate any figure. He used new fabrics such as ultra suede, in particular to create his shirt waist dress, a subtle adaptation of a man's shirt with buttons all the way down. It became a fashion staple. Holston's designs often mimicked his daily uniform. In fact, some were nearly identical. Holston wore a cashmere turtleneck, a matching cardigan or loose cut jacket with a pair of trim trousers. He was also rarely seen without his entourage of models dressed head to toe in Holston designs. Star names including Pat Cleveland, Alva Chin, Karen Bjornsson, Angelica Huston and more. Dubbed the Holstonettes by Andre Leontali, they were all tall, slim girls with beautiful faces. They displayed Holston's intent on creating clothes for all women as the group was quite ethnically diverse. The models would be together in editorials, ads, and at all Holston related events. In 1979, Holston and 27 Holstonettes went on an international tour to major cities, Paris, Beijing, Shanghai, and Tokyo to promote American fashion. The girls wore complimentary, streamlined sportswear so anyone could stand next to anyone and not clash. Accessorized with dark sunglasses and matching ultra brown suede luggage, there were over 500 outfits packed for the trip, from travel outfits to those for activities and excursions. Holston designed various styles describing his process, saying, one has to think of every American wardrobe need, from the with it young girls with style, to the woman that leads a corporate structure lifestyle. For disco nights, he made dresses, and for professional occasions, he offered skirt suits. He still added his signature flair in his more corporate designs, particularly in 1979, with his asymmetric collar, saying, all the business and luncheons taking place across the table, this is something that attracts attention. Holston was one of the first to do unisex fur coats, sweaters, and leather jackets. Menswear informed his most popular designs, yet Holston did not opt to create women's clothing that looked as if it was literally borrowed from a man's wardrobe. Instead, he created a range of classic pieces that reflected his own subtly unisex style. Holston said his work was an experiment that was revolutionary in its day. Whilst Liza Minnelli, lifelong friend of the designer, described it saying, he single-handedly changed American fashion, making it clean, 
elegant, he was a minimalist. He made women look beautiful. They wore clothes, the clothes didn't wear them. Throughout the 70s, Holston designed many uniforms. In 1976, for the US Olympic team, the Girl Scouts and the NYPD. In 1977, he even designed for the staff of Braniff International Airways. By 1983, Holston Enterprises had generated $150 million in sales. He had grown his empire through licensing deals for fur, luggage, linens and cosmetics. Yet, as high as Holston's career had flown, it took a severe hit that same year when he signed a deal with JC Penney to create a collection of affordable apparel, accessories and cosmetics. It was expected to be revolutionary and generate $1 billion in revenue in its first five years. However, Holston's association with a mid-tier retailer cheapened his name and led to high-end retailers, most notable notably Bergdorf Goodman, to drop his lines from their stores. After another acquisition of Houston Limited in 1983, Houston began to lose control over his namesake company due to his party life and drug abuse. By 1984, he was banned from working for Houston Enterprises, losing the rights to design under his own name. For the rest of his life, Houston tried everything to regain control of his brand, but ultimately, he was unsuccessful. It was acquired by Revlon in 1986. Here, Holston was still paid a million dollars in salary per year, but had no role in the company. He spent his time designing clothes, mainly costume, for his friends Liza Minnelli and Martha Graham. Revlon continued producing clothes, working with various designers until 1990, when Revlon discontinued the clothing portion of the Houston line. In 1988, Holston attested positive for HIV. With his health dropping, he moved into the care of his family until he eventually passed away in 1990, just aged 57, after battling an AIDS-related cancer called Kaposis sarcoma. Holston's life and impact on the fashion industry amazed others. Many in awe of his innovation and tragic downfall created a huge demand to see more of this man's riveting story. In 2010, a documentary focused on him was released named Ultra Suede In Search of Holston. In 2019, another documentary filmed titled Holston was released covering his life as a whole. But more recently, in 2021, Netflix released a five-part biopic covering Holston's larger-than-life story. The show offers a dramatised version of how Holston's career skyrocketed, was thrown off by his excessive partying, and ultimately led him being fired from his own company. After Holston passed, his company faced new ownership several times, each attempting new strategies to keep the brand alive. Some released fragrances, others reattempted apparel, and some enlisted popular designers to take over. In 2007, Harvey Weinstein teamed up with Tamara Mellon, the co-founder of Jimmy Choo, and Rachel Zoe, a stylist, investing $25 million to resurrect the brand. Each partner disagreed on which designer should be placed at the helm, with votes between Gian Battista Valli and Marco Zanini. The position was eventually given to Zanini for his work on the Donatella Versace, but after just one year and a failed collection, he was removed. British designer Mario Schwab replaced him in 2009. At this time, Holston Enterprises decided to launch a second line called Holston Heritage. This one based on archived sketches by Holston with modern updates. The same year, Sarah Jessica Parker was spotted wearing two heritage dresses in the film Sex and the City 2. Her role playing Carrie Bradshaw is one of the biggest fictional fashion icons of the modern era and her influence on the current trends was undeniable. Holston Enterprises noticed this and hired Sarah Jessica Parker as the president and chief creative officer of both the main Holston and heritage lines. However, after two years, Sarah, Schwab and Harvey Weinstein all left the company. In 2012, new ownership and talent were brought in again. More relaunches, revivals and failed ready-to-wear were produced. By 2015, a deal was made selling the H by Holston line to QVC, in which they aimed to produce more affordable, elevated sportswear tailored to the mass market. Is this just history repeating itself? Selling the name to a lower tiered market, ultimately cheapening the entire Holston empire? Was this destined to fail? Or is there still a hope of a miraculous revival? Will we ever see Holston on the runway at New York Fashion Week and be wowed by the work? Ken Arnon was named the creative director of the brand in 2022. So do you think he's got what it takes? Or is this truly the end of the line for all of Holston's incredible work? The story of Roy Holston is actually a really, really sad one. And when we were putting this video together, there was just so many occasions where we were all like, this is just really, really upsetting. He was one of the most revolutionary designers of our time. 
and yet hardly anyone knows about him. I really, really appreciate you watching this video. And if you want to know more about the luxury fashion industry as a whole, I would definitely advise watching this video here just because it's full and full of information. Remember to join me and Ella in the look circle if you want to get involved with some of the questions and queries that we put out. But if not, I will see you in the next video.